You know, I need the picture of my lab so that I can talk about it. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll talk about my lab before you see the picture here. <laughs> so this is my audio neuro lab. My lab uses evoked potentials uh, to investigate neural processing of speech signals across the lifespan with a particular focus on older adults. As my primary research investigates the neural mechanisms that contribute to speech perception deficits in uh, older adults. Uh, my lab connects between basic research and clinical translational research. And this comes, as I, as I mentioned, from my clinical experience as a clinical audiologist and speech pathologist. The third project that you see here on the screen actually came to me from our diverse campus, as we are all bilinguals on campus, and I am a multilingual myself. So I also investigate the physiological and perceptual differences between monolingual and bilingual populations. But as for what I want to share with you is some of the findings of the first two projects with older adults. Well, adult aging is associated with speech perception difficulties, declines in cognitive abilities, and hearing loss. In my postdoc in Maryland, I investigated the differences between younger and older adults. You can see me actually on the left edge over there. I was a little bit different with a big pregnant belly with my second son over there. So what we investigated is that we wanted to examine the differences between younger and older adults. And these groups, these two groups were with normal hearing audiograms. They both had normal hearing thresholds. And what we've seen is that you can see the older adults in red. And what we've seen is that we've seen that the older adults showed lower cognitive processing than the younger adults in working memory, in processing speed, in inhibitory control and attentional tasks. And when we looked at their physiological uh, uh, measures, using EEG uh, electrophysiological measures, we saw again in red that the older adults showed less accurate neural responses to speech sounds compared to the robust responses you see in blue for the younger adults. And when we looked at their perceptual performance under challenging listening condition, and here specifically they performed uh, speech uh, uh, sentences, under a, a challenging listening condition of noisy background. And again, we see that the older adults had lower performance than the younger adults. And remember, these are older adults with normal hearing. So speech understanding significantly degrades with aging. Aging can lead to sensory impairments, such as age-related hearing loss, which is considered one of the most dominant health conditions in older adults. And adult aging brings special challenges for speech comprehension due to this age-related hearing loss. We know that there is a worldwide expectancy, and we anticipate even an enlargement in older adults and also an enlargement of the people with hearing loss. And despite the advanced technology of hearing aids, individuals do not seek rehabilitation. Only one quarter of those who need to use hearing aids actually use them. Untreated hearing loss in older adults may accelerate declines in cognitive processing. And it can accelerate, and we've shown that it accelerates declines in neural function. Remember the, the slide I show you? I showed you these were uh, declines in cognitive processing in older adults with normal hearing. So we've seen that older adults with hearing loss, even this generate decline uh, becomes even more massive. And all these can lead to depression and social isolation. So this association between auditory perception, cognitive processing, or mental health motivated me to examine whether 
the restoration of sensory and ability, whether um, increased audibility through the use of hearing aids can positively affect or offset these cognitive and neural declines. So we tested a group of older adults, we fit them with hearing aids, and of course we had a group of uh, non-hearing aid users as a control group. And what we've seen is that we were the first to demonstrate that the use of Teams in the big teams in the US are citing us, so this is working. And we also showed that the restoration of sensory input through the use of hearing aids for use of hearing aids for six months can improve cortical function. So our findings show that these can improve cognitive and, and cortical function, and, and the use of hearing aids can offset physiological a subcortical decline. And there is a possible mechanistic association between cognitive processing and auditory perception. And that hearing intervention, whether be it hearing aids, and now I'm implementing the research into home-based auditory training, maybe perhaps this can delay the aging process. Of course, we cannot make a generate offset, but perhaps we can delay the process. Well, I believe in community change and public impact. As you can see here, I was invited to a news show to talk about my research, and I aimed to transfer the scientific knowledge I obtained from the lab to an audience of older adults to spread health education. And here, specifically, I, I talked about how to influence the understanding of healthy aging. And guess who heard me talk? It was Grandpa Simpson. And let's see what his friend brought him as a birthday present. Of course, why would it work? Shall I? Birthday present you can really use. A call girl that kills me after? A hearing aid. A hearing aid? Forget it. People will think I'm old, Dad. Come in. You are old. You've lived long enough to see your prejudiced attitudes come back into fashion. <laughs> Lousy Greeks. Grumpy Grandpa is happy, I made my point. <laughs> so now uh, I'm implementing the research with the hearing aids into auditory training at home so that older adults can train in their convenience and also, of course, a on the basic side of it, to understand the mechanisms of perceptual learning in older adults, and also, of course, to promote well-being and um, promote healthy aging. And actually, today at 3 p.m., I'm, initi I'm initiating my research with Rambam Healthcare Campus on the consequences of a hearing loss in children. And as I mentioned, I have three little uh, kids. This is my oldest, where he participated in the pilot that I just showed <laughs> Leslie that my the that manuscript was just accepted for publication. And this is Anadel, my student. And of course, I would not produce without my excellent students here at the University of Haifa. And this is a lab meeting in a Christmas evening and back in the life of COVID. 
with my PhD and master's students. And hopefully there's a postdoc on, on board, hopefully to get him some funds. You know, I'm still a junior scientist. I would need funding for all my EEG measures and my brilliant students. This was a little about myself. This was a little about my research. This is where I live, and I'm very happy to come to work every morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. to share my labor of love. So this year marks the 50th anniversary of this remarkable university. We sit on top of our beautiful campus on Mount Carmel, and we should feel very proud of what we have accomplished. We will now show you a short film we've prepared marking this festive occasion. Over the past month, our governors have received a voting form pertaining to all fiduciary duties and responsibilities. As our chairman, Mr. Bradley Bloom, was unfortunately unable uh, to attend this year's proceedings, he has asked that Dr. Efrat Sofer, a fellow governor and co-chair of the University of Haifa UK, take his place in reporting to us today. In order for Dr. Sofer to be able to represent the chairman in these proceedings, I kindly ask that all governors present in the room raise your hand if you have no objection to this. If you have an objection, please raise your hand. Thank you, let us proceed. I have the pleasure of calling Dr. Sofer to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Boker Tov. Thank you, Hanin, and thank you, fellow governors, for allowing me to present the chairman's report in his stead. It's actually my first in-person governors meeting, so it's an honor and a pleasure to address you all. Just a few words to introduce myself. I'm the chair of the Board of Advisors of the Esri Center for Iran and Gulf States Research, and I serve on the Executive Committee of the HMS Haifa Maritime Policy and Strategy Research Center here at the University of Haifa. I'm an active member in the World Jewish Congress, the representative body of Jewish communities in over 100 countries worldwide, and also serve on its, uh, on its Executive Committee under President Ronald Lauder. My own academic and professional career has taken a keen focus on policy and strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the Gulf states and the Middle East, as well as battling anti-Semitism worldwide. 
As you've heard from Hanin, I'm a proud co-chair of the University of Haifa, UK. My grandfather, Meir Ezri, Zichonoli Vracha, the highly decorated first Israeli ambassador to Iran, founded the Ezri Center, realizing a long life dream of researching and shining a light on Iran and the Gulf states. My beloved grandfather would be so proud to see the Esri Center and the University of Haifa at the cutting edge of relations with the Gulf, following the Abraham Accords. I'm so proud to see his legacy live on at the University of Haifa. I'm proud to stand before you this morning. Over the past year, two of our fellow governors have passed away. The first is the longtime president of the French Friends of University of Haifa, Mr. Jules Bloch. We mourn his passing and extend our condolences to his family. In March of this year, we bid farewell to a dear and beloved friend of the University of Haifa and a dear and beloved friend of my own family. Mr. Younes Nazarian, our cherished benefactor, has passed away. The University of Haifa has prepared a short tribute to honor the inimitable Younes Zichonoli Vracha. In the past three decades, Younes Nazarian has been an inseparable part of the University of Haifa community, a devoted governor, an enthusiastic advocate of our students, and the main benefactor together with his beloved wife, Soraya, and their devoted daughter, Sharon, in the establishment of the largest academic library in Israel, the Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Library. Yunus Nazarian was a giant among us. He was one of the major friends of the university, uh, providing the resources for allowing us to develop the finest university library in the country. His great love of Israel, his devotion to our soldiers and his commitment to the university all came together in a moving and very special way with one of the most unique scholarship programs in Israel. 121 scholarships given to 121 university students, each scholarship bearing the name of a fallen soldier in the Second Lebanon War. <laughs> אני מקווה שהעובדה שאני לומדת בעזרת מלגה על שם ניסן תיתן לי את הכוח ואת היכולת לסיים את לימודיי בהצלחה כשהדרך של ניסן תמיד תהיה אל מול עיניי. אני מאמין שנעשה כולנו צוות באוניברסיטה, הסטודנטים וכל אחד מהנוכחים כאן כל מאמץ להפוך בדרך זו ראויה כל אפשר. לקורבנם של הנופלים. תודה רבה. His greatest gift to the University of Haifa in particular and the higher education system at large was his generous gift towards the refurbishment of the university's library and the establishment of a new wing now and forever known as the Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Library. For Yunus and Soraya, the library is the heart of the university. A clear statement for the desire and values to promote knowledge and wisdom for a better society. It was the philosophy of both Yunus and Soraya that a multidisciplinary university like the University of Haifa should have one central repository for books and documents, and that should be in Central Library. No doubt that thanks to dear Yunus and Soraya, our library is such a meaningful place for our university community. For his steadfast friendship with the University of Haifa, Yunus Nazarian has received our highest accolade in 2007, an honorary doctorate. You'll be missed. 
Dear Governors, a few weeks ago, you received a message with a voting form and materials for your review and your vote. Thank you to all governors who voted. I'd like to, to report the results at this time. The second term of our dear chairman, Mr. Bradley Bloom, has been ratified. On behalf of all of us, I send my sincere congratulations to Mr. Bloom. We're very grateful for your leadership. We're also delighted to welcome the following new governors, whose term was approved by our votes. First of all, Mr. Alexander Karpov of Switzerland. <laughs> Mr. Karpov is a dedicated friend of the university. He's an international financier and technology investor and founded a Swiss holding company named Renovatio. He served on the board of the University of Haifa, Swiss Friends, and Mr. Karpov is with us, and it's wonderful to see you in person. Next is Ms. Iris Kleinman, a member of the University of Haifa Executive Committee, also elected as governor. Ms. Kleinman is a division director at Discount Bank Israel. Welcome, Iris. <laughs> Next is Mr. Sharon Zaid, who also joins us. <laughs> Mr. Zaid is a member of the University of Haifa Executive Committee and has been elected as governor. He's a leading member of Israeli industry and today is heading a company initiating industrial sustainable solutions. He's a, a retired colonel in the IDF. Welcome, Sharon. Next is Dr. Zach Glickman, a member of the University of Haifa. <laughs> Dr. Glickman is a member of the University of Haifa Executive Committee and has been elected as governor. Dr. Glickman is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of R&D and the Engineering Division of Raphael. Welcome. As part of the voting form, you were also asked to ratify the appointment of key university position holders. I'm happy to report that all the appointments were ratified. First up is Michael Viner, Vice President and Director General. Mr. Viner was the Chief Financial Officer prior to assuming the position and has many years of experience in top management of large companies and entities. Baruch Marzan, Vice President for Inter Internationalization and Sustainability. Mr. Marzan was the Vice President and Director General of the university for 17 years prior to taking this role. In his new role, he's responsible for formulating and implementing the University of Haifa's global strategy for the international school, incorporating sustainable goals into the academic programs at the school based on the United Nations SDGs and directing the university's Sustainability Council. Anata Baron, Chief Financial Officer. Ms. Baron is a seasoned and certified accountant with many years of experience in managerial positions. Congratulations to you all. Your success is our success. To continue with the report, the university budget for the 2021-2022 academic year was ratified. The financial statements of the university as of September 30th, 2021 were also ratified. The appointment of the university's CPAs for the academic year 2022 to 2023, cost, Ferre, Gabay and Kaiser were, was approved. And I also wish to mention that the university's annual report of the control committee, composed by the chair committee, advocate Bashar Fahum Jayusi, who's also here today, was sent for your review. Thank you, advocate Fahum Jayusi, for your dedicated work throughout the year. And that sums up my report. Wishing you all an excellent rest of the day. Thank you. Toda.
Thank you, Dr. Sofer. We now proceed to the president and rector's reports. Please note that once they both deliver their, their reports, we will open the floor uh, for your questions. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of inviting my president, our president, Professor Ron Robin, to deliver his report. Uh, thank you. Before I deliver the report, just a few personal remarks. First of all, Hanin checked my hearing recently. <laughs> I will not give you the results here in public. Thanks, yes, please. <laughs> I, I should also notice, I mean, I should probably not say this, but I, I noticed uh, in the, the, the Nazarian um, documentary here that I need to change my wardrobe. <laughs> We're in the exact same clothes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wonder if you notice the art here. I, I, when, when, when the session is over, please look at some of the artwork that we have over here. It's the work of our own faculty here. Sharon Poliakin. Tzivi Geva, Philip Renzel, Lihi Chen, Yitzchak Golombik, all members of our faculty here, some of Israel's premier artists have donated here uh, uh, works of art that you should look at as uh, we move on. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of our neighbor, the mayor of uh, Osfia, Bahij Mansur, who is here in the audience. Thank you, Bahij. <laughs> Um, among us here, I, I cannot but mention, I cannot move on without mentioning Manfred Landstein, who is here with us today, one of the first um, chairmen of the board, not the first one, but one of the first ones, the second one, thank you, who's been with us for as long as I can remember. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Shimon Amal, Professor Shimon Amal, who is currently the president of uh, Vizu College of Art and Design. Some of you may have read in the newspapers that we are merging. Shimon, thank you for being here. <laughs> and now we can move on to the report. Um, try not to press any buttons. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here and celebrating our 50th year. I recently noticed Queen Elizabeth talking about her 70th year as being queen. And she said, when it comes to marking 70 years as being queen, there is no guidebook to follow. It's really a first. I have no intention of being here for 17 years, nor do I intend to be a king or a queen. But celebrating 50 years of the university is really a first, and there's no guidebook. It's a very exciting moment. And bear with me as we go through this presentation. It is far from perfect, but it's a collection of my thoughts. So let's move on. One thing I'm sure um, we know, we need to take what we have done this far in research and teaching in terms of social and economic impact, and we need to create a sustainable future. I think the starting point for that is understanding where universities are going. What is the path that we must pay for ourselves in order not just to stay relevant, but rather be significant for our students our faculty and society as we move into very, very uncertain times. The world in general, I hope you don't get too dizzy seeing this, and universities in particular have entered an age of uncertainty. Um, uh, the world now has to tackle severe climate change. There have been, it has multiple devastating consequences. Other consequences are social and economic inequality. There have been dramatic changes in political orders um, and, and, of course, sweeping pandemics. Who can, can forget that? And um, so as we move along, um, uh, how do we prevail in an age of uncertainty? How do we redefine what knowledge means under such circumstances? In times when everything is exposed and everything is transparent, sometimes in the name 
of democracy, uh, information can be easily weaponized by anti-democratic players and others. In an age where public trust in political institutions and gatekeepers is in decline, uh, uh, even in mass media and in other traditional entities, there are very few institutions left that the public can trust and is willing to, to, to provide some credit. And I would like to believe that one of those institutions is still academia. Because what is a university in the eyes of a public? It's a place where questions are asked, where we answer questions, but only after a long and exhaustive process of trial and error. I hope it is still considered to be a bastion of truth. And in times when we are flooded with fake news, pseudo-truths, and, and frequent inaccuracies, I'd like to believe, and I hope this is the case, that universities are one of the few places that are still considered reliable and trustworthy by the public at large. And yet, even the university, that gatekeeper of knowledge, needs to adjust to current events, or we too will become gradually incoherent, we will change shape, we may even disappear. So when we speak of universities, you know, we're a thousand-year-old enterprise. It's nothing new. But the COVID-19 period is ultimate proof that even we, this thousand-year enterprise that has survived over such a long period, we need to do some fundamental retooling. We need to take into account the influx of digital ecosystems, both for learning and knowledge. Uh, otherwise, we will not survive. In other words, if we wish to contribute, if we wish to flourish, we need to become drivers of change. We need to change ourselves. We've just been working hard over 50 years, discovering and in innovating. We need to try and understand what we need to do for the next 50 years in order to be productive and fruitful on our way to make a difference. And with your permission, I'd like to elaborate on five elements of the university of the future. I've mentioned before the question of access to knowledge, and indeed, we are gatekeepers in that sense. We're the last gatekeepers. We must also ascertain that we do not only increase accessibility to research and higher learning, but we also figure out how to distribute scientific knowledge and make them available to all. In other words, universities are and can continue to be a hub of knowledge, maybe the sole one. And naturally, as universities, we have a certain advantage that we do not seek financial profits. We're not market driven. This will keep us, I hope, neutral, unlike the tech giants, which are market driven. Um, this, I think, is a special quality of the university. But the real challenges of our time are globalization, global mobility, digital technologies, the fact that everything today is digital and global. This will bring a situation, I believe, where the number of universities is going to shrink dramatically, as there will no longer be a need in a world of globalization and digitalization, there will no longer be a need for multiple local institutions. And so we will see growing competition between the universities that survive, especially those that are not included in what I'll call the top 100. These will remain in a league of their own, uh, and the rest will have to fight for their existence. Who will prevail? I think universities with global impact and critical and unique products. Those who, like us, think locally but act globally. The ones that will enhance new fields of knowledge, that will integrate seamlessly with the economic sector. Universities that will provide immediate answers to the big questions posed by society. This may sound very ambitious. How can I claim that a university of, like ours has a place of distinction in that new world? Why will we flourish in the future, given the type of competition that will be? So, um, I've been telling myself stories over the years. Always remember that we're very unique. 
Well, that's the story that everybody tells themselves, that we're unique and we're special. And then I thought, OK, we'll just continue doing what we've done in the last 50 years, perhaps a little better. But then I realized that running in place will get you nowhere fast. And then I said, you know, we're small, we're relatively swift and agile, we can allow ourselves patience. But what is the real added value that will enable us as a University of Haifa to both exist and flourish in the future? I'll make a few points here. I would like to make the case that we are indeed unique because we operate, as you can see in this wonderful room here, in three natural laboratories that give us a significant advantage with global impl implications. It is mountain, city, and sea. These are three natural laboratories. The mountain, we'll discuss it a little later, is a treasure trove for anybody dealing with evolutionary science, human and otherwise. The city, the city of Taifa is tiny. It's 250,000 people, but it's the best possible laboratory for understanding social change because of its diversity. And the sea, for all practical purposes, we live in an island nation. The sea is our lifeline for water, energy, and food. I believe that these three natural laboratories give us an insight on how societies, ancient and contemporary, can deal with radical change and radical conditions. So let me just elaborate a little bit on some of those points. Say a word about the mountain. So when it comes to the acute matter of food security, the most critical element in human nutrition, we now see it as part of the Russian-Ukrainian military crisis, is of course wheat and other cereals. Everyone in this room knows that we are on the verge of a nutritional catastrophe. But it is here on the mountain that we discovered the origins of wheat. The first uh, ex examples of wild wheat were discovered here. And it's through genetic enhancement of that wild wheat that we hope to solve the food crisis. Decoding the genome of the mother of wheat, first discovered here in the valley in 1906 by Aron Aronson, is the key to resolving world hunger. Four years ago, our scientists, led by uh, Professor Tsion Fahima and Professor Asaf Dissenfeld, I'm looking to see if I can spot them in the room, completed the genomic decoding of wheat in what is considered as one of the major scientific breakthroughs of recent years. So it's here in the valley, just below us here at the university, is the key, one of the keys to resolving world hunger. And their work promises to make a major contribution to the future of food supplies in the future. Now the city, when it comes to the city, we have realized the dream of becoming an urban university. We're now spread in downtown Haifa. Our presence in the port offers unique interaction between academia and industry. Our ability to provide direct access for our students and faculty to the tech scene, I think, is key to our relevance to the, to the future. But it's the diversity of the city that makes us relevant. Do you know that in the city of Haifa, there are 16 different religious sects. In a city of 250,000, 16 different religious sects. This is a living laboratory for modern urban life. Every challenge, every opportunity that you will find in a big city, you will find here in Haifa. Part of the ecosystem of a vibrant city is providing health and well-being for all. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we here at the university have taken upon ourselves. We all know that there's going to be a chronic shortage of doctors that will lead to a tremendous crisis. And the only solution to that crisis is through paramedical fields. Many of the critical domains that today are in the hands of MDs will move to other fields, like nursing, like the fields that Hanin works on, um, and together with a variety of urban public health centers, we here at the university are in the forefront of preparing medical professionals who will be able to address that crisis that is so uh, obvious to us all. In other words, we are creating a pathway 
for a practical healthcare system involving, involving multiple proxies for doctors. There are never going to be enough doctors as there are. Now I want to go to the C. Did you hear that clicking? Yeah. Uh, this is an example. You know, this is the source of our protein and the drinking water, but the example I'd like to share with you is quite spectacular. You saw a little about this before, and it takes place in the deep sea where sperm whales are communi communicating using sort of moss sounds. We are part of an interdisciplinary effort that spans research groups at universities across the globe. The University of Haifa uh, um, is involved in pr producing a model for non-human species communication in the future. NASA is also partnering in this project. So just imagine what could come out of this mega study involving MIT, Harvard, UC Berkeley, my alma mater, Imperial College, and the University of Haifa. This is a great example of how a small university like ours collaborates with giants. This is another reason why I think that our university is going to flourish in the future. We know how to collaborate and talk to whales. One of our biggest strengths and the reasons that we will remain a significant center of knowledge is our unique ability to join hands and brains with other institutions. Academia that seeks to stay relevant must employ multiple power multipliers. During recent years, there have been several attempts to create such mega projects. We have established an interdisciplinary brain and behavior project spanning the gamut of disciplines across the university. There are 50 researchers from every faculty in the university who are involved in this enterprise. Uh, we are not only involved here at the university, we have spread our wings and we are working with Rambam, hopefully to be in the Discovery Tower sometime soon. We have purchased an fMRI with Rambam. Our researchers work with practitioners in the hospital. So in other words, we have figured out that we are not going to compete with others. We are going to collaborate with others. And we will gain, everybody is going to gain from this. Nobody loses from this. It's a win-win situation. By breaking the traditional boundaries, by figuring out how to collaborate and establish relationships with others, other research institutes and other universities, we will not only survive, we will flourish. We have figured out a long time ago that in order for science to advance, it takes a whole village. And last, but certainly not least, the most urgent matter perhaps in the short run is to address the social and economic rifts that endanger us all as a democratic society. If we think we can take one step further without addressing this pressing matter, we are doomed to fail. Social inequality is now evident in all democracies. But here, it intersects with national and cultural divisions as well. We cannot manage that situation. We have to figure out how to resolve it. We have to expand our student body. We have to have an inclusive and embrace of middle class. We do not have the luxury of minimizing the impact of inequality and other rifts. We must resolve them. So friends, this will make us or this will break us. Women, minorities, <laughs> immigrants, not yet. We have set a goal to provide them all with equal opportunity to join the Israeli middle class. The, the people we teach are the people who will lead us into the future. The research we produce here is the answer for tomorrow's burning questions. Our future hinges upon our ability to capitalize on the three natural laboratories we mentioned, to foster great collaborative projects globally, and address the rifts that are tearing Western democracies apart. Now I know it sounds like I'm a little bit of a dreamer. I am. 
this is plan A, but as I tell my grandchildren, if plan A fails, there are 20 more letters in the alphabet, and we'll continue. The people we lead are the people who will lead us into the future. The research we produce is the answer for tomorrow's burning questions. You may remember, now it's my time to boast, <laughs> that a year ago I declared a $3,150,000 campaign. When I declared it, the audience gasped. The faint-hearted swooned. Children giggled. I'm happy to say that we will surpass our goal for the first year. As you can see in this slide, this year alone, we will have passed our 15 million goal. We are above 60, heading towards 70. So it's thanks to all the people in this room that we've managed to do that. Um, I, I, I need not invite you, you're already part of us. I was gonna say I invite you to join this journey, but you have been on the ship for quite some time, most of you here. It's probably the smartest investment you and your children will ever make. Uh, let's finish with a funny story. Uh, it's a story about Golda Meir, who hosted for the very first time a German leader, it was Willy Brandt, and she took him to Tel Aviv and showed him the Mann Auditorium. It's no longer called the Mann Auditorium. Changed its name recently. It's the main auditorium in Tel Aviv for performing arts. And he turned to her, Willy Brandt turned to her and said, seriously? You named your performing arts center after the famous German author, Thomas Mann? And she said, oh, no, 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 no. This is after Freddie Mann from Philadelphia. And, and Brandt, and, and Willy Brandt asked her, really, really? What did he write? <laughs> and she replied, oh, he wrote a check. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, President Robin. We have a musical treat for you this morning. A man needs to have his word, a little place in the world, not to fear fear itself, a perfect moment. These are some of the lyrics of the song La Tet Belakachat, To Give and to Take, written by an iconic Israeli artist and a University of Haifa honorary doctorate recipient, Mr. Shlomo Artsy, in collaboration with Dudu Tassa. To perform this beautiful song, I have the pleasure of inviting to the stage the musical duo, Kim Segal and Eldar Fridge. Enjoy. Thank you. 
כדי לתת ולקחת, ולא Kim and Eldar. I wish to mention that both of these talented performers are students at the university. Kim studies at the Department of Information Systems and Eldar is part of the Department of Music. We move on to the rector's report. I now have the privilege of inviting our rector, Professor Gur al Roy, to deliver his report. Professor al Roy, the floor is yours. Good morning, dear members of Board of Governors, distinguished guests, faculty member, administrative staff, Mr. President, Professor Ron Robin. I stand uh, before you today and present to you our tremendous progress in the past year. A year ago, I stood on this stage and presented to you the new academic vision of the university. An academic and social revolution that changes us beyond recognition. I would like to go over our vision and to show you what have done during the year uh, to implement it. First, our academic vision. University of Haifa is the largest university in northern Israel, nestled between mountain, city, and sea, located in a unique social and ecological nexus. It is a symbol of excellence in teaching and interdisciplinary research in Israel and worldwide. University of Haifa strategic plan focuses on social and environmental issues as part of its effort to improve human welfare and Israeli society. Its public engagement will play a key role in Israel culture, geography, and community life. University of Haifa is a catalyst for change, promoting and developing leadership in public and business sectors, and encouraging everyday coexistence within Israel between members 
of various religious groups. So, who are we? We are University of Society, Environment, and Human. These areas are the broadest common denominators of the community of university researchers. We are also, as the president said, University of Mountain, City, and Sea. We are the midst of natural laboratories unique only to us, Nature Reserve Carmel Park, City, and Urban Fabric, Sea, the Mediterranean, and its shore. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. At its heart are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries in global partnership. To implement our vision, we have adopted the SDGs. We have adopted sustainability as guidelines of our research, but also as a campus lifestyle. What kind of academia do we want to be? A remote and detached academy, or an academy that is involved in society want to influence it and want to be relevant. This is our revolution of sustainability and this revolution is accompanied first and foremost by academic excellence. This slide describes the excellency of the University of Haifa in sustainability. We looked into leading academic journals and found out that our university is the leader in that field. The highest columns in each table represent University of Haifa publication compared to other Israeli universities. Sustainability in academia is measurable. Times higher education measure university in overall rankings and impact rankings. I am happy to announce that this year the university was ranked 240 in the world. I want to be more specific. Please note our ranking in education in research category. In SDG 4, quality education, we have passed the best university and we are ranked very high, 48 in the world. Also in SDG 3, good health, we were ranked 84 in the world. This is also true in other SDGs, such as 8, 10, 14, and 16. A year ago, we did not enter the general rankings of Times Higher Education in Asia. This year, we ranked 139 place. We passed Ben Gurion University and we are very close to bar -Ilan, and I promise you that next year we will rank even higher. In order to enhance the research at the university in sustainability, we established schools, centers, and laboratories during the year. Each center has dozens of researchers from different departments and faculties. The School of Environmental Sciences was established and it's headed by Professor Lea Wittenberg. The Charney School of Marine Sciences headed by Professor Ilana Berman. The school was part of the Faculty of Natural Sciences and today is an independent uh, school which will become independent faculty in the future. We are the only university in the country that researches and teaches marine ecosystem. Next year, a new department will be opened at the school, Blue Technology, 
and sustainable Mari culture. We rank 98 in the world in SDG 14, life below water. Professor Simon Shamai Tsuri, head of the Center for Brain and Behavior Research, and last year also won an ERC grant. Only three universities have won ERC advance, the Weizmann Institute, the Hebrew U, and the University of Haifa. Professor Meir Yehish heads the Haifa hubs for the study on politics and inequality center. There are cross-faculty collaboration between dozens of researchers. Professor Tali Kristal won an ERC grant in inequality research and together with Professor Yaish, she leads the center. We are ranked 95 in the world in SDG 10, reduce inequality. Dr. Well Simonson Laboratory for Religious Studies promotes SDGs 10 and SDG 16. The laboratory's activities embodies the unique character of our university, a diverse and tolerant university. We are ranked 95 in the world in SDG 16, peace and justice. We established the School of Archaeology of Maritime Sciences. The photo is not Indiana Jones, but the uh, uh, headed by um, um, uh, one of the leading archaeologists in the world, Professor Israel Finkelstein. Two researchers from the school recently won ERC grant. We also established the Inter-University Center for Artificial Intelligence and Ethics with the Technion, headed by Professor May Chemo, the multidisciplinary unit for Polish studies, headed by Professor Marco Zilber, the Kaima Executive Education Center for Social Innovation and Impact Entrepreneurship, headed by Dr. Mayan Nagmon and Ms. Stav Bar Shani. This year, we had extraordinary success in ERC winning. Professor, Bay, uh, Professor Guy Barroz from the School of Archaeology and Maritime Culture, Professor Orna Rabinovich from the Faculty of Law, and Dr. David Frizem from the School of Archaeology and Maritime Culture. This year, we also won a competitive scholarships. Alon, Maof, Zuckerman, and Azrieli. This is a competition between all Israel University, and we are doing very, very well. Our SDG revolutions goes hand in hand with internationalism. In the past year, the number of international students at the university has increased, and new international programs have been opened. Another great achievement we established the Bloom School for Graduate Studies. The main goal of the Bloom School is to advance and promote our PhD and postdoc students. The scholarships we offer are the highest in the country. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our chairman of Board of Government, Brad Bloom, for his generous donation and support. Dear members of the Board of Government, the University of Haifa is participating in global efforts that promote change and will benefit our planet, society, humanity, and Israel. An influential academy. This is our vocation, and this is what set us apart from other university. And now, to the acknowledgement. The sustainability revolution has changed our university beyond recognition, and our research achievements have been outstanding. I would like to thank the excellent 
faculty members of the University of Haifa, and first and foremost, the deans. Since the board of governors do not know you, so please stand up when I call your name. Professor Rosa Likin, Dean of the Faculty of Education. <laughs> Professor Dafna Canetti, Dean of the Faculty of Social Science. <laughs> Professor Isi Doron, Dean of the Faculty of Welfare and Health. <laughs> Professor Ophir Alon, Dean of uh, the Faculty of Sciences. <laughs> Professor Ephraim Lev, Dean of Faculty of Humanities. Professor Oren Gazal Eyal, Dean of the Faculty of Law. <laughs> Professor Shai Tzafir, Dean of Teaching. <laughs> Professor Ofer Arazi, Director of Innovation and Sustainability. <laughs> Professor Jenny Coleman, Dean of Students. <laughs> Professor Lily Barak Orlan, Dean of Graduate Studies Authority. Professor Idio Itzhaki, VP and Dean of Research. <laughs> Professor Meir Hemo, Vice Rector. And Dr. Vardit Garber, uh, Garber Academic Secretary. <laughs> and my right hand woman. The University of Haifa cannot fulfill its vision without the administrati administrative staff. This is the first time our vision is shared both by administrative and academic staff. We will only succeed when working together. I thank to the university VP and De Director General Michael Weiner and to the dedicated staff of the university library. And thank you to the international, internationalism to, uh, and sustainability VP uh, Baruch Marzan. And last but not least, I would like to thank you, the president of the university, Professor Ron Robin, for your leadership, trust, and partnership. Together we will work, and together we will succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Al Roy. Um, at this time, I ask the rector to stay up front, and I call upon the president to join him. They will both be taking your questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and we will bring the microphone to you. We're ready to have your question. Please state your, do you, do you want to give him the microphone, please? Yeah. What will be the influence, do you hear me? What will be the influence of the University of the Galil on the University of Haifa? Um, wow. As many people know in this room, uh, there is in the workings a new university that uh, will serve the Galilee. This is sort of the life project of the current Minister of Education. She has set up a, a committee uh, and um, we can expect developments uh, in the future. Um, we've been talking about this a lot. We've shared our thoughts on this. We don't see this university as competition. First of all, as you saw in my presentation, we're for collaboration. We don't see competition. But we also believe that we are moving in directions that provide us with a unique attributes that will not clash with the University of the, of the Galilee. One example would be the sea. That's just one example. I am not at liberty to disclose this yet, but we do expect very, very good news on the issue of marine sciences 
in the new future. In fact, we know the news, but it's under embargo, and I can't share it. Um, but uh, that is just one aspect. The other aspect, which uh, I'll let Go talk about a little bit, is the fact that um, we are moving um, those parts of our campus that uh, are, are, um, enable us to, to attract students from all over the country. We're moving them downtown. Do you want to say a word about downtown, maybe? I wish I could. The question was whether I could explain the concept of the University of the Galilee. I can't, because there is no need for another university in the north of the country. It's a political decision to have another university in, in the north while we serve the north. Many times we, we presented ourselves as a multi-campus university. We can serve the Galilee. There are political reasons for it, and we work in a world that is political, and we have to handle it. Having said that, we can figure out what we can do better than anybody else. Uh, first, I, uh, I do not afraid from com uh, competitions. And uh, you know, the uh, university in the Galil, uh, I'm not sure that uh, will uh, bother us. The university will focus that what I think in three field of research, medical uh, medicine or medical school, engineering, and uh, uh, nutrition uh, security. We don't have all the three things, and I think that the Technion will be maybe uh, in problem, but not University uh, of Haifa. We have an academic vision, the sustainability. We are moving now to downtown, and uh, I'm very, very optimistic about the uh, future and less about the um, um, the succeed of the uh, maybe new university in the Galilee. You know, somebody asked us before, what's an ERC? ERC is a European Research Council grant. It is the gold standard. If you're good, you get an ERC. Bahit, you want to? Uh, please state your name and question. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to say a few words uh, about uh, the university, how many uh, students from the minorities they are studying here. It's uh, very important that uh, this university hosting so much uh, student from the minorities, and I would like uh, this number will increase in the future. That's the, the key for uh, encouragement, the coexisting and the good relationship between minorities and the majority here is very important. Actually, <coughs> with my city, we're doing a lot of project with the university uh, to encourage people to come and to study, especially women, because we have a problem with the women. And I would, would like to say to the president and the rector, uh, we have to continue with these uh, things because this project would close the gap, uh, especially in education, and I hope that uh, project will continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Uh, University of Haifa is the most diverse campus in Israel. And we, and me, rector, president, I believe the uh, uh, faculty members, we are very, very proud of it. And of course, the collaboration between uh, University of Haifa and the um, Sphere, Dalet Carmel, and other uh, cities and towns in north of Israel are very, very important for the success of the university. I'll just add just one, one word. It's, it's, it's not a luxury. It's an obligation. If we want to have a sane society, uh, we need to make sure that everybody is part of our society. And we know this, and, and both of us agree on this, and I think that's going to take us to good places. We had... Yes. Um, I'm Walter Barton. i from Oxford, England, and I've been involved with the university for many years. Uh, and I'm very impressed with what we heard yesterday and what's going on and with what you, Ron, and what the rector has said in the various developments. Um, there are two areas, and one of them you'll be familiar with. 
<laughs> I'm going to mention, and Ron, you mentioned in your, in your report the importance of evolution and the advantages of the environment here for studying it. You mentioned the, uh, the wheat and, of course, the gene bank, which we're going to be talking about yesterday. But on the list of uh, institutes and other things, I saw nothing that related directly to the potential for evolutionary and biological studies at a, at a quite fundamental level, which, which is complementary to the fact that you're uh, indicating that you're not going in the direction of a medical school as well. And the compensatory side of biology is, is to study biology and evolution. And, and I would urge that, uh, as you know, I've said many times before, that that be given a higher priority. I think it's very important and there are huge opportunities there. The other thing I would mention is I had a very uh, useful meeting yesterday with some of your people in the data sciences. Uh, and I didn't see it mentioned specifically, but I think there's an opportunity there for major developments uh, in, in a collaborative way that are very important. And it, it's not just digital, this, that, or the other. It's, it's data sciences together with statistical analysis and their applications, especially in the biological and biomedical areas. Um, thank you, Walter, uh, for those comments. Let, let me say the following very briefly. Um, we, we, we do see biostatistics as a huge growth area here at the university, and we'll be making some administrative changes in the future in order to uh, accommodate that issue and bring biostatistics to the place where it needs to be in order to have a robust faculty of natural sciences. As far as evolutionary sciences are concerned, we did not mention um, uh, the um, Institute for Evolution, uh, A.B. Navoz, uh, the founding director of that. But tomorrow, we will be celebrating the opening of the Gene Bank, and uh, uh, which has been one of the U UK trustees is involved in that. Um, Sir Mick Davis, and, and will be this, as I mentioned in my presentation, is a major aspect of our development in the future. We have it's absolutely not all of evolution, but your point is well taken. Um, and then we have Professor Thank you, Ray. I'm somewhat baffled about this University of the Galilee question. You said there is no concept for it, which is not a known concept for it, no. but it is a political decision. But what is then the political reasoning behind it? We are not from Israel, so we cannot follow all the daily debates. But what is the major political reason for it? This university <laughs> exists here for 50 years, serves everybody more than well. What is it? Uh, it's, I, I, I'm going to be very, very careful how I answer that question. <laughs> Uh, the current Minister of Education, who is a graduate of our university, all three degrees, right? Yes. All three degrees are from our university, right? Yeah. Uh, she comes from the north of the country. And uh, she comes from Kiryat Shmona, those of you who know the town of Kiryat Shmona, right at the northeast of the country. And she feels rightly so that the Galilee is underdeveloped. And she feels that a university is an engine of change, I would agree. But a university, you do not need a new university in order to provide a, a higher education as an engine of change. We are large enough and we are strong enough to provide that, but there are political considerations that are beyond our control. Shimon, was that delicate enough? Yeah. I will be less diplomatic. <laughs> I wish, I wish I would, I would understand the logic of the Israeli uh, politicians. There, there is no logic, really. Why we need the eighth university uh, in Israel? Uh, eight million people, eight university, million people for each university, it's crazy. We have I, good combat. I have much to learn from the president. 
we have a question over there. Yes, Professor. Uh, I was. I have to say that uh, I was inspired by these presentations. Honestly, I mean, Ron, your presentation really um, blew me away. It was. Uh, it was visionary and it was important. And we're sitting up here in this beautiful place. And I think of the commanding heights of society. And I think of the University of Haifa as being in the commanding heights in certain areas that are extremely, extremely important. Uh, the the our friends from uh, Germany have focused on. Israeli Arabs uh, and on the role of women in Arab society. And I was listening to Hanin and I was thinking, what would the world be like without that kind of brilliant analysis and work that will impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands, millions of people uh, in, their, uh, in their old age? It's amazing. It's an amazing, really an amazing story. So what I would say to you, Ron, is uh, I have a friend in Boston, his name is Robert Kraft, and he talks about his halom gadol, his big dream. So, you know, if you're going to be talking about fundraising, you need to be able to say, if you had an, another three $50 million gifts, what would your halom gadol be? What are we aspiring to? And what are you thinking about? No one dreams better than you, Ron. Yeah, I kind of object to the example of Roger, Robert, Robert Kraft as being from the Bay Area. I have, uh, my fondness does not reside with, uh, with, with, uh, with Boston sports teams. But, you know, I'm actually going to ask Gur to answer that question because Gur is the next generation. If you had $300 million, what would you do with it, Gur? That was a good way of getting out of that question. My uh, very halom gadol is that the president will raise money and I will spend it as a rector. Yeah. <laughs> so if we want to, to be better in the future, we have, we have to hire the best researcher in the world to come to Haifa, in Israeli or uh, abroad, to establish new labs, and I think that the um, Israeli Academy in general and the University of Haifa in, in particular should be, should be more involved in the community. We have just get out from the ivory tower and to make an impact on uh, Israeli society, on the globes um, and, and, and humanities. And I think that our academic vision of sustainability, this is the right things to do. Um, I, two months ago, a um, philanthropist from the uh, Silicon Valley um, donated about $1 billion for And he said that the past decade was computer sciences. The next decade is sustainability, social and environmental. And by, you know, with the money and the halom gadol, we should change our uh, planet and our society, reduce inequalities, and, you know, to, um, to make our uh, world and society better. This is the main role of the acad academy as I see it as a rector of the university. I'll, I'll just add to that. Thank you, Bo. I'll just add to that. Um, we say here, we turn that adage from the 70s to think globally and act locally on its head. We believe very much that the local issues here have global ramifications and whatever we do here uh, can affect the world at large, and we're very much in that. I want to take up a point that you mentioned. A university is measured by many measurements, but two of the most cardinal measurements are the quality of the faculty, and I will say that we have made tremendous strides. You can see by the number of ERCs that we have, we have made tremendous strides in the quality of the faculty that we've recruited. And thanks to the Bloom Graduate School, I believe we will be able to attract the best graduate students. Those are two very important measurements. Who are your graduate students 
and who are your faculty. My chalom gadol, buried, is to get the best possible people from all over the world to come here to the university. If we had a pot of whatever amount of money, um, that's what I would do. That's what the big universities do. I would like to ask both of you um, to tell us a little bit, maybe, with some uh, examples, what is the international connectivity of the university? Who are your major partners? Which countries actually do you um, uh, work best with in terms of academic cooperation? Are you also affected by the BDS? Um, movements, for example, in UK or, U or in USA, starting in Germany. And the pragmatic uh, uh, part of it would be, how can we improve, we the German friends, receiving more information about prominent academics coming to Germany, uh, having an opportunity to invite them for events, for little lectures, and so on, because we are still in a situation with the Hebrew, with the Tel Aviv, that's where everybody goes, that's where all the visits go, uh, Weizmann Institute and so on, and the University of Haifa, we've put on the map for its social responsibility, for its Israeli mosaic, um, for its marine science, but not so much for all the other excellent centers because we don't have practical information and we don't know who you're working with academically. I believe that by the sustainability, we will do better in um, collaboration with other universities, especially in Europe. The sustainability is very, very strong in European university compared to American university. And we can see it um, in the website, in our collaboration, uh, they find great interest in our uh, university. I um, um, met a delegation from the Czech Republic, the Maastricht University. They have a, a polar station in, uh, in uh, Czech Republic. We will have a wonderful uh, co collaboration in, in uh, an environment. Of course, in um, uh, social sustainability, and um, I'm very, very optimistic about the future in regards to the uh, uh, collaboration. Germany is a, a key country for uh, collaboration. The uh, Freie Universität of Berlin, Potsdam University, Hamburg University, and many, many um, uh, others. Uh, since, you know, both of us mentioned that we are uh, in the midst of three um, um, natural uh, labs, mountain, city, and sea, I believe that in the future, international students will come to Haifa and not the Ibuyu and not to the state of Tel Aviv, but to Haifa because we are different, because um, um, uh, we are involved in the community, and because um, uh, students looking for meanings. And today, the sustainability, I think this is the next, this is the next thing. So um, maybe in my report next year, we will see again our uh, increasing numbers of international students and collaboration. And you know, uh, I will be more than happy to come to Hamburg and to ties the collaboration between the two cities and the university. I know we Thanks. have to end this, just yes. one sentence, and mm -hmm. then I promise we'll, we'll go back and sit in our seats. I'm afraid we're, this is the last question. Um, uh, I'm, it's, okay. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this to a close. Yeah. Yeah. But I just mentioned one thing yeah. about international collaboration, and that's with Gulf states. Uh, we are the leading university in Israel collaborating with the Gulf states. And uh, I think I mentioned this yesterday, for those who did not hear this, we're in the midst of a trilateral agreement to Germany, uh, UAE, Israel, led by University of Haifa, on marine research because of, um, you know, water in the Gulf is heating up at a pace which is not unlike the Mediterranean. 
Um, Helmholtz Foundation is leading this with us, the University of Haifa and a couple of universities in the Gulf. Do we have to end? Thank you, Professor. Sorry. Thank Robin you. Robin and Honroy. Of yes. Uh, professor. I'd like to call the president again to speak on the stage uh, about uh, dear departed friend Alf Bet Yeshua, Zachrono Lebrecha. Um, last week we lost a dear friend, a great faculty member and a giant of Israeli literature, perhaps of world literature. Aleph Bet Yoshua, who we all know as Bully, um, departed uh, following a bout with cancer. I was very fortunate. I don't know, do we have a little clip of this? We do, okay. I was very fortunate in the last few months to spend some time with him. And a week or three weeks, excuse me, before uh, he he, he left us. I had the opportunity to, I, I asked him if he would interview, if I could interview him about his book, The Liberating Bride, a Kalam Shachrerit. For some reason they translated it into English to The Liberated Bride, but it's The Liberating Bride, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, he didn't speak about the book, he spoke his mind. mind. And uh, just as a tribute to a friend of all of you in this room here, a friend of uh, a colleague here at the university and a major figure who has left us. We have a short clip from that interview uh, to show you and then we will move on. Thank you. Bully, thank you for coming to No, thank you. You also came to the book and also to the university. The question was, when I write it? When I can take it? ואיך שרפאלי כיבד את העניין שאני גם סופר, ושהיה לי כבר ספר סיפורים שיצא, ספר סיפורים שני, אז הוא היה גמיש איתי. פעם בפעם הוא היה צועק עליי, אתה לא יודע איזה צעקות קיבלתי ממנו, אבל היו אחרים שקיבלו ככה צעקות היסטריות, והוא נתן לי ככה מרווחי זמן ללכת הביתה ולכתוב. ואז כתבתי את הלילה במאי, את המחזה, ומכל מקום, זו הייתה הכניסה שלי. אבל ב-72 הייתה החלטה של הדיקן אז, זה היה בעצם uh, מתי מגד. הוא היה דיקן, הוא היה רקטור, הוא היה דיקן, הוא okay. עשה גם כל מיני מינויים כאלה. הוא היה בחוג לספרות עברית, והוא אמר... כן, א' ב' יהושע, מלמדים אותו באוניברסיטה, אין סיבה שהוא גם לא ילמד ספרות, לא את היצירות שלו. וב-72', אני זוכר, זה היה רגע מכריע, היה הברית מילה של הבן שלי, של ה... ואז הוא הגיע עם מכתב, רפאל הגיע עם מכתב מינוי למרצה בכיר, למרצה בכיר. כלומר, אתה תקוע ואתה יושב שם, וזה היה נפלא. אני עכשיו יש לי פלאז'ר, ואני עושה את זה עם גדולה פרייד, להתחיל פרופסור שלומית אלמוג, חד של דיברסיטי ואיכולת יונט, ופרזידנטל אדוויזר על ג'נדר אקוויטי. הפלור היא שלך. Thank you, Hanin, and thank you for inviting me today to this festive event, festive and exciting event. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm Professor Shulamit Almog. I'm uh, the presidential advisor for uh, gender uh, equity and the head of uh, diversity and equality unit. Before I tell you about it, a little about it, I'm going to be brief and exact, 
because I know it's late and we had this long session. Just a few words of uh, introduction. I'm a faculty member in the law faculty where I do uh, interdisciplinary research. I write about law and literature, law and culture, and about women rights and children rights. So uh, as an academic focused on law and culture, I believe that uh, a rigorous intellectual framework alongside attentiveness to personal experience, to personal narratives, can bring a change, can inform policy, can transform lives, can change society to the better. From this standpoint, I aim to promote DEI. I'll tell you in a moment what is it about. Diversity, equity, and inclusion in our university. So this is uh, DEI. In recent year, we were introduced to this, uh, to this term, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, which is now, I'd say, a global standard in organization, including, of course, universities. The thing is that in our university, we have been doing DEI for many years without knowing it is DEI or without labeling it, but we have been living in our university in a form that really uh, materialize the principles of DEI. You can see in front of you what is DEI, but why is it important? I urge you all to take a second and think about your own personal experiences, about moments when you, even briefly, felt marginalized, discluded, or rejected. For example, when you didn't make the cut for a desired promotion and you knew in your heart that your religion, your ethnic background, maybe your gender, were not the right one for the job. Well, for some, this is not a momentary disappointment or suspicion, a one-time experience. For some, this is life. And this is why we need DEI. DEI is not only the theoretical framework for addressing such situation, but also the set of operational tools to eliminate them and achieve a better university in service of our all. In this uh, short presentation, I will talk only about gender equity and the things we, ha we have been doing about gender equity during uh, the last year. Well, gender equity is not a one-time action. It is a process. It is a long-time process, an ongoing process, which involved several action, ongoing action and movement which I specified here. The first step is data gathering, establishing knowledge about what is happening in an, in an organization or in our university. The next step is trying to detect trends. It's trying to decide how to, how to go on when you look upon the data and achieve further goals. And this is what we do in our university. We try to discover trends. But uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, start with this uh, good figure, you might say. When you compare the number of uh, women in faculty in our university and other university, you obviously can see that our position is good actually the best, the best in Israel when we compare ourselves to other university. So that is great, indeed, but we did more than that. We start digging into the data. When we dig into the data, 
we see that there, is, there are significant differences between the numbers of women in different faculties. While in certain faculties, there is much more women than men, we can obviously see that uh, in other faculties, actually in our two largest faculties in the university, which is social sciences and humanity, there are more men than women. And this is, of course, a situation that we have to address, and actually, we are committed to address. Even worse than that, when we look at the ranks, at the ranks of men and women in the university, we see that the higher the ranks are, the fewer are the women that we can find there. When we look at the two uh, upper ranks in the university, which is associate professor and full professor, as you can see, the numbers, there are much more men than there are women. So what can we do about it, and what should we do about it? Well, here is a good figure. Here is a good figure which, uh, sorry, Okay, uh, how can I go back? Oh, thank you. Uh, here's a good figure. Uh, our rector actually announced since day one that he's going to change the rate of uh, hiring women as compared to men. And as you can see, he succeeded in doing so. This is the trend of the last three years. And as you can see in this graph, you can see the change. You can see that now more women are hired as faculty members than men. So this is actually a fantastic figure. And I do hope, actually I'm sure, that the trend is going to move on according to this. Uh, what happened? Can somebody help me? <laughs> OK. Uh, now, I'm sorry, but I'm going to uh, mention uh, not so nice figures. Look at that. This is, uh, this is the number of men in our senior management at the university and the number of women. Uh, as I said, I think it's not a very good figure, and I think that this figure should be changed. And to add to the list in front of you, think about it. I hope I'm not doing a factual mistake, but I think that no woman has ever served as a chair of the board of governors of this university. So think about it. I don't know if there's a good reason for that. There's no good reason for that. OK. Back to the good figures. Back to the good figures. Number of deans at the University of Haifa. Well, uh, we are close to gender parity when we are talking about the number of deans. And you're not, uh, you're not all uh, faculty members or uh, academy members, but this uh, committee, the appointment and promotion committee, is considered to be the most important committee, isn't it, Guru, at our university? In every university. In every university. Uh, we'll explain to you later why. But in this most important committee, there is gender parity in the University of Haifa, and I'd even say that we were the first university in Israel to have a gender parity in this, uh, in this committee, in the, point, in the appointment and promotion committee. So we have some very good figures. We have some problem. And to address the problem, we have doing a lot of exciting project within the gender uh, unity action last year. 
Uh, I'll mention uh, just a few. You can read more about it in the position paper that you all have in your files we prepared during uh, last year. I just mentioned that uh, we, change, uh, we change a lot during this year. We created an environment which is comfortable to family, to uh, women and men with small children. Uh, we offer uh, innovative, and I think we are the only university in Israel that does, that does it, that uh, offer cognitive training pertaining to academic career to women when they start their career. We have such good reaction that I think I'll talk about it with the management that we have to offer it also to men, not only, not only to women. And, uh, and uh, many other projects, which, as I said, you can read at your, uh, at your position paper. What about the future? We have a lot of future goal. I'd say that the most important goal is, uh, is uh, moving toward a synergetic uh, space where we will be able to achieve application not only of gender equity principle, but of gender diversity and inclusion principle. Sometimes these aims could be conflicting. So we have to achieve a theoretical framework of how to put them together and work with them together. And uh, this is what I'm going to do in the, uh, in the next year. And I hope to meet you during our next meeting and tell you about our further DEA achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Almong, for the important work that you do. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end the session, please note that the Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Library is holding an exhibition of its magnificent rare books collections in honor of the university's celebration. You are all invited. Our next event will take place at the Hecht Museum, where, we, where you will all convene in 15 minutes. Please proceed to the entrance of the museum and on the ground floor, and you will be directed from there. It was a pleasure to host you this morning, and thank you for allowing me to share a bit of my research. Toda and shukran.